Admiral Ayalon, thank you so much for spending a few moments speaking with the Combating Terrorism Center. So I'd like to start with your home country. Israel has, since its inception, been facing the threat of terrorism. How have you seen that threat, though, evolve in the last few years? Uh, Israel, from uh, the day it was created, uh, in a way we are fighting four wars. Um, and the question is, uh, which war are we, fight are we fighting today? Uh, <clears throat> the first war was uh, in order to create a state of Israel, a Jewish democracy. Uh, the second war was against all the enemies, organizations, and states who were trying to destroy us as a Jewish democracy. The third war is to expand our eastern border and to build more settlements. And the fourth war is uh, to, in a way, uh, not make it possible to create a Palestinian side, a Palestinian state, on, on the other side of Israel. So the question that we have to ask ourselves: Which war are we fighting today? Uh, I, I leave it now because the answer is politics. Um, I think that uh, what we saw during the last 20 years or 15 years is uh, the result of two revolutions. First of all, the revolution in, uh, in communication uh, and uh, the internet revolution. And uh, I think that we do not have um, the idea how much it influences on the way we are fighting, uh, not enough. And the second is globalization, not on our economy, but uh, on our culture. I think that these two revolutions create a totally different war. And if you ask me, these are the two main uh, parameters uh, that change the way we are fighting today. Of the various threats that Israel is facing, though, and the world at large, is there one in particular that gives you the greatest concern? The question is, when we are using the term threat, uh, what do we mean? I, I believe that um, in order to understand exactly what, what, what we, are, we are facing, um, we have not only to know better our enemy, but, uh, and, and this is something that we are not doing enough, we have to understand the enemy. It is becoming more and more difficult because in order to understand it, um, you have to understand what brings him to use the violence the way he's using. And it is very, very difficult to do in time of war. Um, it brings you to a place in which, and um, as a society, uh, it is a very, very dangerous place in which when we try to understand him, uh, it makes it much more difficult to fight against him. We used to say, okay, Hamas on the south, Hezbollah on the north. Um, but Hezbollah and Hamas are changing. If you ask me, uh, I am always afraid or concerned on the next threat. Um, Hamas today is not Hamas the way we knew 20 years ago or not even five years ago. Uh, and the same is for Hezbollah. I think that uh, what we see today is ISIS are closing to our Syrian border. Uh, it is totally a different phenomena, uh, totally different from what we knew, totally different from Hamas and, uh, and the Islamic Jihad or Hezbollah. And, um, and I don't think that uh, we saw this kind of phenomena on our borders. So I believe that the next threat is what we should concern of. Would you say that it's correct that we look for a uniform strategy against this threat? Or shall we be looking at each group individually? We should do a huge mistake if we should try to create a unified strategy. Uh, all those threats are totally different. Their behaviors, their ideologies, their motives, uh, their goals. So yes, on one hand, I believe that we have to to understand the phenomena of terror. But when we are trying uh, and, and to create a, a kind of a doctrine or a theoretical framework 
But when we have to shape a, a strategy, uh, it should be a totally different strategy facing each threat. Can you speak a little bit about your role both in Israeli politics and then, of course, previously in Israeli military, and how spanning those two spheres mm -hmm. helped you, and in what ways did it help you? Look, I've been fighting against terror uh, since I believe we, we faced terror in Israel. Um, I did it when I was in the Navy, and I did it later when I was in the in the Israeli Shin Bet, um, and later in politics, in the cabinet. I have to tell you that uh, I don't think that I understood the terror the way I understand it today when I was in the Navy. Uh, I believe that uh, when you are in the military, uh, you see targets. Uh, when you face them in the battlefield, no matter where, uh, they are targets. You have to face them, you have to fight against them, sometimes you have to kill them. Uh, in, the, in the Shin Bet, it is totally different. Um, in order to fight a terror target, a person, you have to know everything about him. You have to know him by his four names. Usually Muslims have four names. You have to know uh, his wife, his children, his parents, his village, his neighbors, his friends. Otherwise, you cannot understand him and you cannot fight against him. Um, you cannot get the information needed in order to do it. And no matter who you are and no matter who is your enemy, uh, and even when you know that the moment that he will be out. He will kill you and your children and your friends. He is a human being. And once he is a human being, first of all, you are not afraid of him. It's the way you are afraid of him when you don't know him. Second, you understand more his motives. And I believe that uh, this is what happened to me when I left the Navy and joined the Shin Bet, and this is when I understood that not all people, but these organizations are totally different, and we should not make the mistake trying to fight them, all of them, as if they are the same. You mentioned, sir, knowing the enemy, and yes. certainly nothing could not be... Not only new. knowing, understanding no. the enemy. It's, yeah, it's, it's, because um, I have to tell you, we in the military and in the Shin Bet, we, we are used to try to know the enemy, to read about him. Uh, when we are doing it against admirals or generals, we, we read their books, the, we, 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 we are trying to, to listen. It is totally different because usually they are coming from a similar culture like ours. In this case, it is totally different. It is not enough to know them, we have to understand them. Because there is a huge gap between our both cultures. How successful do you think we have been at understanding the enemy? Not enough. I, uh, it, uh, and and I, uh, I am not blaming anybody. Uh, let me finish by telling you a story. Um, I, was, um, I was in politics, it was after I left the Shin Bet, and uh, we had a, a horrible, a very, very cruel terror event in which three terrorists killed a whole family, a mother with four children. And after killing them, they shot their heads in order to make sure that they are dead. So it, it is, I don't know, it's, you, you cannot describe how cruel it was. And there was a discussion in our radio. And, uh, and I was interviewed, and before me, they interviewed um, a philosopher. And the person asked the philosopher, how can you explain this kind of violent behavior? And, the, and, and, he, and he told him, uh, I cannot explain, and I don't want to explain, 
and we should not try to explain because they are animals and we have to fight them, to kill them, etc., etc. And he added, if we shall try to understand, we might forgive them and we should never forgive them. So later I was asked and I said, I understand his answer, but I do not accept his answer. We have to understand them. It is, we, we, should never, we should never forgive them. And it is a very, very thin line between understanding and forgiving. But unless we understand, we shall not be able to fight them, or at least we shall not be able, we shall not be able to win this war. And I believe that one of the main reasons why we did not succeed the way we should uh, is we do not really understand where it comes from. There are some that might say that by giving the enemy um, time at the table or uh, the opportunity to be understood, that that's giving too much credence to them. That's giving too much, uh, allowing too much from them for mm. them to have a voice. What would you say to those critics? It is totally a different kind of war. In the past, the idea was to get enough power in order to, to defeat them in the battlefield. The war, in the wars that we are fighting today, uh, it is not enough to have power. Um, in our case, uh, we can destroy the whole Middle East. Um, but the victory today is not achieved in the battlefield. Uh, the wars that we are fighting today in a war, in a way it is a totally different kind of war. We are fighting at least, probably more, in four different arenas. The battlefield is one of them. But in addition, we are fighting low lawfare, which is a legal issue, uh, image fare or media fare, and you should understand it better than others, and diplomacy, but in the same time. So even if we achieve all what we want to achieve in the battlefield, and most times we do, it will not bring us closer to victory because victory is achieved somewhere in a different place. It is achieved in our case, in the case of Israel. It is achieved in the minds of spectators all over the world, in the images. Finally, if you ask me, in order to achieve victory, we have to control the narrative, meaning we have to send the message that we are just. We are the good people. And they are the bad people. And as long as the people all over the world who are watching television will not get my story, my version of this narrative, of this battle, uh, I'm not going to win this war. Because if and if I win the battle and the day later I will face sanctions, economic sanctions, academic sanctions, diplomatic sanctions, I will lose the war. So the idea is not to win the military battle. We have to use our military power in a totally different way in order to win the war in the other arenas. And this is why if I do not understand them, probably I can win the military battle, but I'm, no, I'm going to lose the war of ideas in the eyes of the spectators all over the world. The victory that you described yes. will take a long time, no doubt about it. Yes, it is a very, very, very long battle, yes. Is it a victory that you foresee uh, being achieved in your own lifetime? First of all, yes. Uh, but this is only because I'm going to live forever. 
Um, look, we have to redefine the idea of victory. Um, victory, when, when we used to discuss victory in the old wars, in the traditional wars, we used to discuss, first of all, the future, the better future that will come after the military battle. But if the assumption, your assumption, and I totally accept, if your assumption that it will be a very long war, probably it will last 40 years until the middle of this century. I think that we have to redefine the concept of victory. I think that first of all, we cannot use future terms when we discuss victory. And probably, and I'm saying it because I'm not sure, but probably we have to understand that the terror is not trying to kill all of us. Uh, terrorists are trying to change our way of life. So probably if we shall say every day when the terror organization did not change our way of life, we are winning. So to translate victory into the present and not to discuss the future. It means that our strategy should be totally different. Our strategy is not based on a decisive victory on the battlefield. But probably the idea of a stra different strategy should be standfastness. Standfastness by meaning you want to destroy our democracy. You want to destroy the way we live. You want to destroy our values, civil rights, minority rights, human rights. As long as you will not achieve it, we are winning. It means that we are winning every day, but it means that we will have to fight for the next one, two, or three generations. And this is something that I'm not sure that we paid enough attention in order to redefine the concept of victory and only then to try to create a different strategy. Admiral Ayalon, we could speak to you for hours on this topic. Thank you so much for Thank speaking with much. us. Thank you, sir. Thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate it. Thank you.